again everyone, it's me Matt and thank you for joining me today. We are talking about self-propelled anti-aircraft guns and that of Soviet slash Russian nature. But before we do, let me know in the comment section what your favorite anti-aircraft platform is out there, whether it be sci-fi or real life. I want to know what you would take to battle if you needed to use the most sophisticated or what you think to be the best anti-aircraft defenses for any era of aircraft, whether it be World War II or modernized, I'd love to hear your opinion. So as you can see by this beautifully camouflaged twin barrel behemoth, we're talking about the ZSU-57-2, which is basically two anti-aircraft guns strapped together in 57 millimeter form and put on a T-54. That's its basic simplicity of what it is. And this is why I love this damn thing, because 57 millimeter rounds are an absolute behemoth of an anti-aircraft round to be using in such quick succession. Putting that on top of a T-54, these things are just incredible. Now, we're gonna go over its uh, intricate history and details today, but uh, personally, I've always been very fascinated in this vehicle because it's been somewhat of a, uh, it's been an anomaly really in the anti-aircraft world. It never really got to what it was meant to do. It was a little late to the party because at the time of its production, uh, it was being caught up with some really modernized Soviet and Western anti-aircraft technology. And uh, it seems to be one of those vehicles that has survived in certain nations around the world. But for Russia, it was kind of a, uh, this was a bit of a mistake. We need to get rid of this thing as quickly as we can. So let's go over its uh, technicalities and a little bit about this vehicle. So the ZSU-57-2, or otherwise known as Object 500, is a Soviet self-propelled anti-aircraft gun, or SPAAG, equipped with two beautiful 57 mm autocannons, which derives its name from the ZSU, denoting anti-aircraft gun self-propelled mount with the 57 indicating the bore size and the two representing, of course, two of the gun barrels. It marked the Soviet Union's first mass-produced track SPAG, earning the unofficial name as the Sparker due to its twin autocannon configuration. During the Cold War, the vehicle served extensively with the Red Army of the Soviet Union. However, there were a lot of technological advancements in NATO nations which rendered the vehicle quite outdated within a very short time period. The vehicle quickly replaced by more advanced vehicles in the late 1970s, and although it found use in a lot of other allied countries for Russia and Soviet at the time, um, it did not last very long, and it was manufactured in plant number 174 in Omsk from 1955 to 1960, and a total of 857 units were produced, which for myself I thought was actually quite a low number considering when you want anti-aircraft guns, you want a lot of capability for the battle groups of the Cold War era, um, but of course, as I said, Newer technologies were coming out, we've talked about Shilker and things on my channel before. They were really competing against this concept and unfortunately it just didn't survive the trials and tribulations of Cold War. It was more of a World War II vehicle in all honesty. It was introduced to provide anti-aircraft defense to armored forces and the vehicle featured a very light chassis which was the medium T-54 tank. This resulted in a better power to weight ratio. The artillery piece assigned to tank regiments in batteries of eight demonstrated good speed and operational range, though not surpassing that of the tanks it protected. Earlier Soviet vehicle attempts with heavy machine guns evolved into heavy caliber repeating cannons, which is what we're seeing on the beautiful ZS-57. Following in a lull of development of post-World War II, the Soviet army bought modern SPAAGs, and initially when they started bringing these vehicles into place, they said, ah, we're a little too late to the party, as I mentioned. It was just not what they wanted. The idea of mounting these cannons onto a wheeled towed carriage actually also failed too because they wanted to put them on trucks, uh, but it didn't make a huge amount of sense again because in 1948 the Object 500 emerged as the front runner, combining the firepower of those two cannons with the chassis of the tank, but even then didn't keep up to the expectations of the Soviet forces at the time. The project faced many delays, modifications and trials with the series auto cannons causing setbacks. Uh, the design into the vehicle just wasn't quite working. Even the ejection of the rounds out the back, the empty casings, the chute system had some issues when they first brought it into conception. Formal acceptance into service occurred in February 1955, initiating serial production from 1957 to 1960, resulting in eventually over 2,000 units. The ZSU-57-2 made its public debut in November 1958 in Moscow on a military parade, and it was given a very welcoming upscale representation of being one of the best anti-aircraft guns at the time. But of course, it just wasn't. Externally, it retained the T-54 hull, featuring a rounded box-shaped turret housing, two elongated cannons on the top. And of course, the T-54 had a very distinctive low profile. However, the turret completely negated this. The tank was given four heavy-duty road wheel systems, and the track was just standard dead track, not live tracks. 
and uh, actually had pretty good capability cross-country as most T-54s were. Positioned at the rear of the hull, the engine contributed to a lot of the vehicle's mobility and it was fast. It was able to keep up with even the light mechanized infantry battalions if it needed to, but for the most part it was designed to protect the flanks and the rear of armored brigades moving forward. The driver sat at the front forward position, but the open top turret would allow for full 360 degree traverse and could fire at any angle. The guns had extensive elevation capabilities in engaging low flying aircraft, each capped with a distinctive conical flash suppressor. The vehicle housing was welded from armor plates ranging in thickness from around 8 to 13 mm with a century located rotated welded tower on a ball bearing system and removable armor plating could be installed if necessary. In the stowed position the tower could be covered with a canvas awning. Now crew arrangements, although quite open in the turret, were strategically organized. The left loading gun member, the gunner in the center, the sight fitter to the right of the gunner and the loader of the right gun, obviously on the right, and finally the ZSU's commander workplace in the center of the tower. The open top nature though exposed the gunnery crew to the element and battlefield dangers prompting the assurance of armor protection as well, giving a more upgraded awning so to speak. But lighter than the original T-54 tank design with the thickness ranging from 8 to 50 millimeters, it was still extremely susceptible to being engaged. Believe it or not, the vehicle could actually be submerged in its own little duck configuration with some skirting and some upgrades, but the reality was it was again super susceptible to engagement and to put this thing on a lake to engage aircraft would be a very silly idea. So let's talk about the cannons themselves. So it was armed with two 57mm S68 auto cannons. Each gun had 300 rounds of 57mm ammunition available to it. The automatic operation of the gun relied on the principle of utilizing recoil energy during the short course of travel for the barrel. In terms of accuracy, it really came upon the skills of the gunners. If they did not apply the appropriate lead to the target, there was absolutely no way that these rounds were going to hit on target. Some ammunition could be fused to give a airburst capability, but again, if you did not place lead ahead of the target, it was not going to successfully impact and engage the target when you needed it to do so. However, the gun's horizontal guidance speed was around 30 degrees per second and a vertical speed of around 20 degrees per second, which in all honesty is a very quick traverse and elevation speed for a gun that is very, very heavy when you put two of them together. In the event of an electrical drive failure, the system did have a contingency of manual pickup if necessary. Now the commander took charge of horizontal guidance while the gunner handled the vertical aspect. This proved to be very difficult for them, requiring quite a bit of physical preparation for them well above the average crew gunner of anti-aircraft guns at the time. The practical rate of fire ranged from around 100 to 120 rounds per minute per barrel with a maximum continuous shooting duration of around 40 to 50 rounds before the barrels needed to cool down. Now the power plant for this vehicle, being very similar to the T-54, was given by a single V-54 series 12 cylinder 4 stroke water cooled diesel engine delivering around about 520 horsepower at 2000 rpm. Now being this vehicle was based around the T-54 chassis, it's a fairly prominent off-road vehicle, it could go quite fast as well, uh, and its range was actually pretty good too, operational range around 260 miles on paved road and 198 miles off-road. It did have a speed of round about 65 to 80 miles per hour on road and round about 30 to 40 miles per hour off road which to be honest of a vehicle of this kind is pretty impressive despite these capabilities though the vehicle did struggle to keep up with the advancements of enemy aircraft and air defense elements in nato including other platforms like the m247 sergeant york which was uh, although more of a modernized platform uh, a little bit faster being able to provide air support in between the battle groups, you know, skirting around the flanks, etc. But for the most part, it was fairly mobile and able to do what it needed to do. However, there was a few additional drawbacks to this vehicle. One of the biggest ones was the air-cooled nature of its cannons, making it very difficult for prolonged and sustained firepower and very risky when doing engagements with air fire because, uh, you know, when you've got a good target, you've got good lead going, you're like, I just keep putting rounds down this barrel. You could actually have a malfunction that could damage the vehicle or the crew with that much heat. And as the 1960s unfolded, of course, it was one of the most least favorable implementations of anti-aircraft at the time because the introduction of Shilka started to come out with radar-operated tracked anti-aircraft systems in 1965, which made a significant shift in integrating with the existing formations of the ZSU-57s in service. Now, progressively, they did slowly get kicked out of the armed forces from uh, the Soviet and Russian era, but the hulls did have a second life found in the 1970s, serving as training platforms for tank drivers, while others were relegated to storage or repurposed actually as live fire targets, and some even sold for scrap. By the 1990s, the ZSU-57 was completely phased out of Russian and Soviet service, with many units passed on to friendly nations, 
Some were modernized by new owners, incorporating some radar technology to adapt to the changing landscape of modern warfare, however for the most part they were just sent to the scrapyard. During the Cold War it became a staple inventory of the Warsaw Pact and Soviet allied nations. East Germany emerged as the first foreign operator of this Soviet weapon system, deploying them all the way up until the late 1970s. However, they've been used by a multitude of other countries including Angola, China, Egypt, North Korea, Sudan, Syria, and they're still to this day being utilized. But what's more fascinating about this vehicle is, of course, it's originally designed for anti-aircraft combat, but it proved very versatile in supporting infantry actions, serving in both roles during most of its conflicts. The vehicle's presence in the Middle East, where the Soviet influence was extremely strong, was of course very, very obvious. It saw significant use against the newly founded nations of Israel, notably in the Six Day War and the Yom Kippur War, as well as the armies of Egypt and Syria. However, it faced significant challenges in modern theatres, particularly against Israeli air support and tanks because it did not have the guidance to track the aircraft coming after them. The vehicle also did very well in the Vietnam War in both aerial and defensive capabilities on the ground. The vehicle, though very, very limited in its automated radar guidance devices, limited its efficiency completely, and despite the drawbacks though, it did find some context of use in April 2014 and there was video footage surfacing showing a ZSU 57 II in action with the Syrian army near Damascus. Now, let's say we acknowledge its weaknesses. With the low rate of fire and the lack of automated radar guidance, it's crucial to consider there's a huge role in its collective air defense in its time when it was designed. If it actually had come out in the 1950s, fully released, and you know, even during the uh, Second World War, it would have done very, very well, but it can't really contribute as a overall air defense system because it just doesn't have that integration between radar, etc, etc. Therefore, as a means of collective air defense, at aircraft flying up to around 4,000 meters, this thing is completely useless. However, armored brigades and battle groups at the time when it was first initiated used Dushkas mostly for anti-aircraft capabilities and machine guns, which only covered altitudes of up to about 1,000 meters, which meant that technically, in theory, the ZSU 57's complementing capabilities gave a little bit more stretch out to the further distances in the air, but it was so difficult to actually track and engage targets that it just did not keep up to the modern day standards. However, there is notable accounts during the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, of achieving a few actual aircraft kills in one of them against a low-flying British Tornado Strike Fighter. Even during the 2003 American invasion, the ZSU-57-2 still lingered in the Iraqi infantry, causing some havoc for low-flying helicopters or even Apache helicopters during invasions, uh, which utilized, you know, close air support. These vehicles were still punching out 57mm rounds into the sky, causing some real problems for anti-aircraft defensive measures that aircraft had to encounter. So, it's hard to really give this vehicle a thumbs up, this is an amazing bit of kit, because it was just left too late. It was way too late in its, you know, capacity. Um, I think Russia and the Soviet nations knew that this was something that is going to die out very quickly, and if it wasn't capitalized during the Cold War, it likely would never be utilized again. Shilka obviously came into the forefront and was kind of like, step aside buddy, I've got better tracking than you'll ever have than the human eye. Um, and that's the way we now see all anti-aircraft defenses primarily is through tracking and, you know, laser guidance or radar guidance. So it was really sad to know that ZSU 57-2's, you know, role for the most part was kind of just pointless. <laughs> um, but a really cool bit of kit. I mean, when you look at this thing and you see it driving around, you're like, holy cow, you would not want to be downrange of this thing. Personally, I think it's more of a sort of Terminator role style vehicle where it can support infantry or armored flanks, you know, giving some support to infantry if they needed it. But for today's climate, it's so soft skinned in terms of its armor capability, it's pointless. And especially if it's open to the elements, you won't want to be a crew inside of this thing, maintaining those guns, in, you know, extremely cold weathers, especially during the Cold War, wet and miserable and cold, uh, not a good time. So sadly, the ZSU 572 is uh, one of those vehicles left to the history books still somehow though utilized across the world. But for myself, I respect it. I like the way that one, what they wanted to do with that 4,000 meter altitude coverage, but I can't imagine trying to be a gunner on one of these things, maintaining engagements onto an aircraft at high, high speeds. We're not talking about, you know, prop planes here. We're talking about low flying jets, high speed attack helicopters. It's just going to be a really difficult engagement, but uh, respect to those who operated them. We use them. It's kind of cool. Anyway, thanks for watching today, folks. Really appreciate you stopping by on today's video. If you did enjoy, please please make sure you click that little bell by the subscribe button. I know many of you got very upset recently when we keep asking you to click the like button, all that stuff. That's because no one does it. <laughs> they just It's not that you're lazy. It's just people just don't want to do it because they're just ready to move on to the next video. But it really helps the channel, folks. So thank you for those who have been doing so. And also thank you to those who have been supporting my Patreon on PayPal. Hope you have a wonderful day. Take care. All the best.